Welcome and thanks for joining us this morning. My name is Andrew. I'm the children's pastor here at the church and I just want to say we are glad you are here. As we get started today, I want to get you caught up with what's going on here at the church. And the big news, the big announcement is as long as we are in yellow next week, we will be meeting in person again. So we're really excited for that. We're excited to get back together. Uh, the, the thing you need to remember though is if you are planning to join us in person, you need to register online. It's especially important now as restrictions have tightened even more. And so we need to know that you are coming. So please visit the link and register online. If you're not comfortable doing that, give the church a call and we can make sure you're registered for the service. We really need to have an accurate count uh, for the services moving forward. And since we are now gonna be meeting in person, as long as we are in yellow, on March 28th, we are gonna be holding our annual meeting. It's gonna be right after church. You're gonna to need to register for that as well so we know you're coming. And again, that's all tentative. It all uh, relies on us being in yellow, but that's the plan March 28th for the annual meeting. Also, the plan is still to bring Lancaster kids back. I know it feels like I've been talking about this for years, uh, but we're still planning on Lancaster kids returning. We're not going, going to return the uh, first Sunday. We're gonna take a few Sundays and get comfortable and make sure everything's running smoothly. And then we'll get started with Lancaster kids. Tonight though, there is a Zoom youth uh, meeting. So if you are in youth at middle school or high school, we want to encourage you to jump on to Zoom with us. We have a, a chat and we play some games and just have a little bit of a fun time and some catch up. And if you have not gotten the link for that meeting, please, you can email Pastor Wayne at this email below and he'll make sure that you have the information you need to join our meeting. Also, here's your friendly reminder that next week is the time change. Spring forward, you know, everyone's favorite one where you get to lose that hour of sleep. Uh, but this is just a reminder, you know, you don't want to show up to church late on the first week back. So put that in your calendar. Next week is the time change. And lastly, we're going to be taking part in communion during the service today. And so I encourage you to be prepared for that. If you want to join us in communion, just grab uh, some bread or, or a cracker and some kind of juice and uh, you'll be all set to go for communion later on in the service. That's everything I have for you this morning. Let's continue on now with the time of worship. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. The sun.
time has come Still my soul will sing your praise unending Ten thousand years and then
Last week, we started a four-week series called, And When You Pray. Based on Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 6, verse 5, as he was uh, beginning to teach on prayer in his Sermon on the Mount. The reality is that Jesus expects us to pray. He expects us and invites us to come to God, to be ourselves, to open our hearts and our lives, and just pray, no matter what. Now, last week, we talked about when we pray, we should just be ourselves. Just come to God honestly, openly, without trying to be someone or something that we just aren't. Simply, we want to come to God with all that we are, warts and all. Uh, Next week, we'll think a bit about how prayer is something that we need to do to engage in the work of building God's kingdom with him, partnering with God. And I know that a number of you are great knitters. Now, I have tried knitting a couple of times before, and I have no idea how to make those knitting needles work together. It just, it, I just can't do it. And it takes me so much concentration. I couldn't do anything but focus on what I was trying to do. And even when I do that, I end up with this. I mean, that's a mess. Now, but I know that for some of you, uh, knitting has become like a second nature to you. In some ways, you don't even have to think about it, right? You can, you can knit a hat, a scarf, and two mittens all at the same time that you're cooking dinner and you're coming up with a cure for the common cold. I, I don't know how you do it, but it's unbelievable, unbelievably amazing to me. And, and the scarf and the hat and the mittens end up coming out practically flawless. Dinner is terrific, and no one in the house even has a sniffle. Right? The reality is that when you started knitting, it probably didn't come to you quite that easily. It took work and practice until you got to a point where you could knit well, I mean really well, and still do other things like carry on a productive conversation or watch a hockey game or do something else. Sometimes the more we do something, the more natural it becomes. And that can be true for prayer too where we allow prayer to become such a natural part of our lives, a natural part of of who we are, that it envelops all that we do. Today, we're going to be thinking a bit about making prayer an ongoing part of our lives. And, And when you pray, don't stop. And when you pray, don't stop. In other words, prayer will not be a just visiting part of our lives, where we come to God when we say grace before meals or just before you go to bed and you You say your little prayers before you go to bed. But rather, prayer will become a a normal part, a natural part of of who we are and what we do and how we live our lives. Jesus invites us to pray and to live moment by moment in a lifestyle of prayer, in a way that we are in constant communication with the Father, seeking to be alert and awake to his presence all the time, wherever we are, being able to say in the moment, God, lead me in this, or, or, or how can I respond to you, uh, God, or how can I respond to this situation, God? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 to 18, Paul writes this, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. But the key for us is verse 17, pray continually. Keep on praying. Don't stop praying. Pray all the time. Now, how do you do that? How do you pray without ceasing? How do you possibly pray all the time? I mean, what we're talking about here is not about those specific times that you might carve out to to take just some quiet time alone, just between you and and Jesus. But rather, this is about living a lifestyle that is in, in a sense, constant communication, constant communion with God. It's about making our life, our internal center of our life, into a sustained act of communion with God, living in his holy presence. This is not a constant prayer, but a constant openness to God, from a place where we're learning more and more all the time to simply to trust him, to rely on him, to, to let him lead us through each and every moment, aware of his presence with us and how he wants to work in and through us in our world. We have to understand something about the nature of God, his omnipresence. That is to say that God is everywhere, in a sense. 
Not that he is in everything or part of everything. That's something completely different. But that's not really what we mean, pantheism. What, what we can think of it in is kind of two parts. There's God's sustaining presence. Now, in a sense, that means that God sustains everything. He sustains all things. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, the sun is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. You see, whether you and I acknowledge God or not, his sustaining presence holds all this together. So in that sense, his presence is everywhere. God's personal or holy presence, that is, this is his holy presence that is found where it is invited. So God's presence is with us to the extent that we invite him to fill us with his spirit and allow him to be present with us. So God's presence sustains everything everywhere, but God's holy presence that we were created by God to be filled with is found where it is invited and welcomed in. It's God's presence, his holy presence, dwelling within us that we really need in order to pray continually, as Paul said. The reality is that we can push him away. We can reject God's personal presence because that's what sin does. It, it builds a barrier between us and God's presence. In, in Genesis, we read about Adam and Eve in the garden. We, what they had was a continuing walk with God through the Garden of Eden. They were constantly in his presence. Until the time that Adam and Eve made their choice to go their own way and sin. Then they were banished from the Garden of Eden. Their sin had separated them from that intimate, personal, and holy presence of God from their lives. God's sustaining presence still kept it all together, but no longer did they have that same close personal relationship that they did before. Sin had placed a barrier and pushed them further away from the Father. When you and I are in a broken relationship with God, our experience can be one that feels empty or longing, maybe even a purposelessness, a life that longs for something more. And the gospel, the good news of Jesus, is not about us trying to get to God, but rather it's the story of a God who loves us, wanting to do everything he can to be back with us, to fill in us the void that sin has created in us. It's the story of God doing everything he could, even coming here to be with us as Jesus, to fill us with his presence and life. It's what we were created for to be and to live in such a way that we constantly and without ceasing, as Paul says in Thessalonians, live in not just his sustaining presence, but also, and maybe even more importantly, in his life-giving, life-transforming, life-leading, holy and personal presence. You see, whether we ever recognize it or not, this is the hunger of every human heart. To live fulfilled in the personal holy presence of the Father. When we come to faith in Jesus as Lord and begin to follow him as king, the Bible says that we are in Christ. In a spiritual sense, we are put, put into the center of God's holy presence. In Christ, we are brought into a, a new spiritual reality or, or position where we no longer have to be outside of that presence. So if you are in Christ... Christ is in you. What that means, especially in terms of what we're talking about, praying continually, we now have the invitation, the position, and the privilege to be in God's presence, praying continually all the time. Constant communion with God. We also know the reality is that it's hard to live moment by moment in the awareness of that reality. And sometimes we allow our worldly concerns and our cares and sometimes our sin and our bad habits and our behaviors to separate us from this amazing reality. Probably a good chunk of our days when we could be connected and led by God's holy presence, instead we find ourselves unaware of it. And in some of those moments, we find ourselves floundering 
because we fail to be relying on God's presence in our lives in those moments. Jesus in John chapter 15, in verses 1 to 4, he says this, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. You see, Jesus here reminds his followers to remain in him. The word remain here, really, it means abide. And Jesus says that we need to live in him, and he will live in us. When we do that, we will produce fruit. In other words, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Things that change lives and change communities when we live them out. Jesus says, make me your home address. Live in his presence, moment by moment, and Jesus will make his address in you and me. And what that does is opens up a continuing line of communication, moment by moment, between us and God. This is what Paul was getting at when he said, pray continually. He meant abide in Jesus moment by moment. Be aware that you are in God's presence all the time and live in that. Let that lead you and guide you. Rely on that. Turn to him. Listen to him. Be aware. Be aware of his presence. Living a life where we are able to pray continually means learning to make our thought process a prayer. It's about opening ourselves and whatever we're doing, wherever we are, and whoever we're with. Opening all of that up to God and letting him lead us in his way in the midst of it all. It means you can make the most mundane, mindless activities opportunities for prayer. Like doing the dishes, mowing the lawn, shoveling, even knitting. Whatever. But you can also make the most intense activities Opportunities to be in tune and in communication with God in prayer. As we live more and more aware of the reality that we are in God's presence all the time, we can be led more effectively into the life that he's created for us to live and be more effective at sharing the life and the love that he calls us to live and to share. When we remain in him, when we make God's holy presence, our address, and he lives in us, what we discover, can discover, is a life more like what God created us for. A life with purpose, hope, leadership, power, and effectiveness. But we can get distracted so easily. Squirrel! Ah, sorry. Um, But it takes discipline to stay in God's presence moment by moment. And I am the king of distractions. And so I want to give you some homework as we think about what it means to pray continually. Try, to, try, try doing it in the midst of the seemingly mindless activities that you do. Just letting your thoughts be a prayer. When you're driving to work, when you're showering in the morning, when you're cooking dinner, when you're cleaning, when you're out working in the yard or shoveling snow, whatever you might be doing, Put up reminders around your house, sticky notes to remind you to stay awake to God's presence. You can set alarms or reminders on your cell phone, whatever you need to do to help you stay alert and aware. And don't be discouraged. The truth is just too good to allow discouragement to distract us from it. The more you trust and seek to be awake to his presence, the more natural it will become. The truth is, You are in Christ, and Christ is in you. If you have surrendered your life to him and made him the king of your life, you can make him your address, and he will make you his. And if you've done that, benefit from that reality. Benefit from the reality of that truth by seeking to be aware of his presence moment by moment, praying continually. 
And today, if you haven't made the decision to make Jesus your king, you can find fulfillment for the longing of your heart. And you can experience the life-giving presence of Jesus in you. Just surrender to his love now and learn to pray continually. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have created us to be in relationship with you. And Father, you have opened up the door for us to be in constant relationship with you. And I pray, Father, today that those of us who are already in Christ, that we would understand the depth of of meaning of what that is. That because we are in Christ, we are in you and you are in us and we can be in constant communion with you, constant relationship with you, constant communication with you. Ready to hear from you, ready to share with you, ready to be led by you. And Father, today, if there's anyone who hasn't yet made that decision to say, Jesus, you are my King, you are my Lord, Father, we pray that they would do that even in this moment. Wherever they are, whatever they're doing, that now would be an opportunity, now would be the time to say, Jesus, I want to follow you as King. I want to be close to you. I want to be renewed and made new in you. Father, go with us in the remainder of this day and into the day and the week that lies ahead, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Today, as we gather virtually together again for communion, Uh, We want to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. The Apostle Paul writes, Let me go over with you again exactly what goes on in the Lord's Supper and why it is so centrally important. I received my instructions from the Master himself and passed them on to you. The Master Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and having given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he said the same thing with the cup. This cup is my blood, the new covenant with you. Each time you drink this cup, remember me. What you must solemnly realize is that every time you eat this bread and every time you drink this cup, you reenact in your words and your actions the death of the master. You will be drawn back to this meal again and again until the master returns. You must never let familiarity breed contempt. Anyone who eats the bread or drinks the cup of the master irreverently is like the part of the crowd that jeered and spit on him at his death. Is that the kind of remembrance that you want to be a part of? Examine your motives. Test your heart. Come to this meal with holy awe. As we prepare to participate in communion and the deacons lead us in the bread and the cup, uh, let's take some time to pray. Father, we thank you that you have loved us with such an amazing love and that you were willing to give yourself for us. You were willing to go to the cross and to suffer that painful death in our place, to demonstrate how much you love us, how much you want to be in relationship with us. And God, we know that there are times when Uh, We have missed the mark of what you have called us to do and how you have called us to live. And Father, we want to take just a few moments now on our own to confess to you those things that have, have pushed us away from you. Father, we thank you. You tell us in the word that when we confess our sin, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so, Father, we're thankful for your love and for your grace and for your forgiveness. And pray, God, that as we continue to worship together here today, that you would be in our midst, that we would sense and know your presence, and we would be grateful and thankful for the sacrifice that you made for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Heavenly Father, we remember that you are the bread of life. You feed our souls and you nourish our hearts, and you give us sustenance to run the race. As we take the bread, we feel the softness of your love. We feel the grace that you give us each day. We thank you for the great price you paid on the cross for each one of us. You rose triumphant over death as Lord of Lords forever as our Savior. Thank you, Jesus. In Luke 22, 19, it says, And when he had taken some bread, he given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Eat of it, all of you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Father God, thank you for the great love you have for us. Thank you for mercy and grace. In Ephesians chapter 7, speaking of Christ, it says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to his grace. Thank you for your son, for his sacrifice, and his shed blood. And thank you for this cup. Bless as we share it before you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Take this in remembrance of Jesus' blood shed for you.